The west coast of the South Island of New Zealand. It's characterised by its wild coastlines, rugged mountains and native bush, and is home to many unique and native species of plants and animals. Just north of Westport is Stockton Mine, Solid Energy's largest open cast coal mine. Large scale mining activities have been going on on the west coast since the mid 1890s. The first coal on the west coast was discovered by uh, a fellow by the name of Brunner who travelled from Nelson down to the west coast in the mid 1800s and discovered coal in a number of locations. But uh, in the Westport area the first uh, coal was identified and mined in about the 1870s, 18, mid 1870s. And by about the 1890s commercial uh, coal mining had been uh, identified as a real opportunity for the coast. After the Second World War, the government nationalised the coal mining industry. This meant that many of the large mines on the Stockton Plateau and around Milliton became state-owned coal mines. The West Coast is dominated by primary industry, so there was originally basically forestry and mining. Now it's uh, more farming and mining. The forestry has essentially gone. There is still a very good fishing industry. But in centres such as Westport, the mining represents a very, very large portion of the income of the town and a very large number of the people who are living there are dependent on either directly or indirectly on the mining activities that we Solid Energy undertake and other companies in the area. So it's a, a very major, major part of life on the West Coast, especially in the Buller. Today, the Stockton mine employs close to 400 people and produces over 2 million tonnes of coal a year. Different grades of coal are found within the site. Up at Stockton, which is about a thousand metres above sea level, there is a gently dipping slope that runs to the east and uh, underneath about uh, 30 to 40 metres of rock there lies a very thick seam of coal. Now the coal varies in quality over the plateau, but in general is the caviar of coals. It's brilliant stuff. The material that we have uh, throughout the mine is highly sought after by the steel making industry, but some areas within that are the, the El Primo coals. So we can take a, a small volume of some coal from the plateau and mix it with other volumes of lesser quality and we can bring it up to a specification that makes it very, very attractive for the steel manufacturing industry. Now, the area around Mount Augustus on the ridge line on the western edge of that plateau contains some of that primo coal. This is the stuff that, um, without which, much of the rest of the coal on the plateau becomes worthless. And it's by blending this very high quality coal with the poorer coals around the plateau that we have a saleable product, that we have a mine that has a life that goes out to 10 or 15 years, um, that we can continue to run the plant and the equipment and employ all the men to do the job. So. The coal under the Mount Augustus ridgeline was absolutely required for the ongoing security of that mine. Mining the ridgeline also presented some logistical challenges. It adjoins land belonging to the Department of Conservation, so Solid Energy built a seven metre high rockfall barrier to ensure the dock estate wouldn't be damaged as a result of any mining activity. It was mostly built to stop rocks falling off and rolling down into the dock estate and causing damage outside of our mining licence. Solid Energy also altered the way they mined the ridgeline so as to limit any potential damage to the neighbouring dock land. We try not to put rocks over the side so we're basically firing very small blasts. We're using a specialist blasting contractor to do our blasting for us up here. Um, we basically look at the rocks that are actually positioned on the edge of the ridgeline and try and determine if any of those are actually at risk of being thrown over the side. If they are, we either anchor them or we try and pull them back from the edge. So we go through a whole risk analysis process as we deconstruct it in each stage. So it's very time consuming, it's quite slow, and so it's sequential. So you've got to, you start in one place and then you just work your way through it. It's the, basically the sweetest coal that we've got left at Stockton. Um, and it's really high value and it's essential really for the, you know, the future of Stockton mine. We conserve it and mine it in a very controlled careful way. We can't afford to actually um, do anything up here that really impacts on the dock estate outside, otherwise it just jeopardises the future of the mine. As Solid Energy was preparing to mine the ridgeline, they discovered that nature had a surprise in store for them. 
what was discovered living above the coal was about to present a problem. In general, the plateau up at Stockton is a windswept, inhospitable place with very low vegetation, it's a subalpine environment, and there's little that one, the casual observer, would consider of having any uh, notable conservation or environmental value. But get down on your hands and knees and things start changing. And when we got down on our hands and knees at Mount Augustus and had a close look there, that's where we found that there were snails, which live elsewhere on the plateau as well, but potentially a species of snails different from any others that have been found to date. So here we were faced with a real dilemma. We had coal that was absolutely essential to the ongoing success of the mine, and on, sitting on top of that coal, a population, a size unknown, of snails that could be absolutely special and unknown elsewhere. What they had discovered was a species of the Paulophantus snail, a large carnivorous land snail. To date, 21 species and 51 subspecies have been identified within the genus of this snail in New Zealand. The species identified up on the Stockton ridgeline was called the Paulophanta augustus and was believed to be under significant threat of extinction. Very little was known about these snails and Solid Energy was aware of their responsibility under the Wildlife Act. In order to mine the ridgeline, they would need to relocate the entire population of snails to another area within the mine, something which had never been attempted before in New Zealand. Clearly it was going to be a significant problem for us to just go in there and start digging. We had to do something before we did that. And uh, I guess there's precedent throughout the world for such things now. You have to consider the environment before you go and undertake whole-scale development. And so uh, we have a policy that says that uh, we, we'll do all we can to make sure that the outcome of everything we do will have a net positive effect on the environment. Solid Energy sought permits from the government to relocate the snails and, in consultation with DOC, started to develop a relocation and captive management plan. We didn't really know anything about these snails, so the question was, well, what do we need to know if, if this project goes ahead? What do we actually need to know to facilitate it, to make it possible? And so that's why I got involved, because my job is the Conservancy scientist, and, and so I was asked to look at, well, what are the research questions we need to look at in this context to make this project happen? What became very apparent very quickly was that there was no real body of knowledge around these or indeed any other snails. We knew that snails existed all over the place. We had a standard uh, sampling methodology and uh, we went into the area and we used that standard sampling methodology. And from that we predicted that there were in fact probably only very few snails, possibly as few as 250 or maybe as many as 500. That was the department's view. Um, or our view was there may have been as many as 1,000 maybe even 1,200 snails in the area. But nevertheless, there was a small population, and if it represented a species that hitherto had been undescribed or was otherwise under threat, then clearly it, it warranted some uh, significant effort on our part to make sure that that small number of snails were preserved. And if you look into the uh, terms of the wildlife per permit that was granted, it anticipates that we would have kept 50 of them for long-term breeding within captivity, and the other 250 at least would have been released out into the wild again. And so that was the premise that we entered into the exercise on. And uh, that was the premise that uh, all our budgets and all our timing and all our staffing requirements were built around as well. Having identified the perceived size of the task and in coordination with the Department of Conservation, a snail relocation team was coordinated. Again, you don't open the yellow pages and find snail searches under S. So we had to develop a whole team and a whole technique, which we did with the department. In 2006, the first snail recovery searches took place. We've got a contractor now who has a team of people who range from tertiary qualified down to uh, local interested backcountry people, people who are interested in being outdoors. We section off an area into a workable size, which may only, it depends on the terrain and the vegetation cover as to how big that is, but it may be only 25 metres by 25 metres. It may be as much as 50 metres by 50 metres. And we literally search uh, under all the vegetation and in the litter that's accumulated on the ground by hand, with a team of people working shoulder to shoulder, crawling through the undergrowth and finding snails as they go. And the thoroughness of that work is demonstrated, I think, by the ability of these fellows to find 
not only adult snails, which may be uh, just over 40 millimetres in diameter at their largest size, but right down to egg clusters and in small recent hatchlings, which may only be six or seven millimetres in diameter. So it is very much like needles in haystacks. Initial searches reveal there to be a lot more snails on the Mount Augustus ridgeline than previously thought. The initial estimates were based on plot monitoring that was done, so that is the the yeah, usual method that we use for snail monitoring is that we establish a 10 by 10 metre plot and you go through very carefully without causing too much disturbance to the habitat and you try and find every snail that's in that 10 by 10 plot and based on that we did estimates of the total population and if I remember right it was just below a thousand animals, might have been eight to nine hundred, that's sort of the estimate of the snails that we thought were in that area that was to be cleared. The lower limit, I think people expected maybe around 250 to 500 snails. In the absolute upper limit, we anticipated maybe 1,000 snails. So we've got um, six times the number of snails that we ever anticipated. Whilst this discovery was good for the species, it also presented a whole new set of problems. It's always a sort of two-edged sword because A, you're very happy that the population you'd thought was under significant threat is clearly not under quite so significant a threat. To the other side of the sword, which means that when we first thought we were dealing with 250 snails and the, the measures that we undertook to manage these required that each one was kept in its own two litre ice cream container, the standard one you go and buy your ice cream from the shop in, 250 of those would require something in the order of perhaps six or eight ordinary upright fridges, um, which we purchased and supplied to the department for their use. When you have 6,000 of them, and uh, 6,000 two-litre ice cream containers, you move from the area of fridges into huge cold stores, which we've now had to purchase or lease and put on site in the uh, department's facility for them to handle and rear and care for these snails. My role here was to um, manage the people that would actually do the work with the snails, and in doing that, we had to de develop and build a facility to put them in, and so we had to manage people to build that facility, basically, uh, from start, when we first received the snails to the situation we are now, we were holding them long term. By the end of the exercise, five cool stores were needed to house the snails, and they were also faced with the issue of feeding them. When we thought we were only handling initially 250 and only 50 would stay in captivity, we'd only need to find a relatively small number of worms, which are what these um, snails eat. When you have 6,000 snails all looking for breakfast, then there's a large number of worms that you need to find. And nobody had done this before again, and we'd assumed initially that the diet of the yeah. snail would rely on the native landworms. And so we had teams of people out looking for native landworms. But it became apparent that we would either remove all the native landworms from some area on the west coast, or we'd have to find an alternative. And fortunately, the commercially grown worms that are used, I think, principally in the... Uh, compost industry and perhaps for fishing and I don't, I'm not sure what else, um, were quite happily eaten by the snails. They don't get one a day, they get a, a limited amount They're on a controlled diet because they put on too much weight otherwise. But uh, luckily we were able to overcome the feeding issue with a relatively simple fashion, but at a scale much, much greater than we'd ever anticipated we'd need to be involved in. All of the snails that have been recovered and passed to the Department of Conservation have been measured, weighed and monitored. Of the 6,000, about 250 will remain being monitored in long-term captivity, with the rest of them gradually being relocated to similar habitats within the region they were found. In some cases, entire blocks of vegetation where snails were discovered have been relocated to already mined and predator-controlled areas of the mine. A sample of these snails is regularly monitored to check the success of the relocation program. So one important part of my job was to um, develop the monitoring for the snails because um, we wanted, to, once we translocated the snails, we wanted to monitor how they do in the new habitat and so I found these little transponders, like I didn't develop them, they had been used on snails before, but I got onto them, got contacts and got them made and um, then we stuck these transponders onto snails so that now we're monitoring 40 snails in every translocation site to know yeah, how the snails cope with the new habitat. We pick up the snails 
and find out where they are. And they're all identified with a little number. And we can say, well, this one was released at point X and it's moved to point Y. It is now heavier or lighter. Um, it's showing some signs of uh, doing well. It's not showing signs of doing well. We can monitor all those snails. Now, snails are not immortal. They will die. And some of the ones that we have released have died. But that is probably within the normal range. It appears that they're dying at about the same rate as if they lived for around 20 years, which is what we anticipate the snails would otherwise live for. Preliminary results from the snail relocation are good. We're still, um, I guess, only halfway through the journey of the successful relocation of the species. Um, but everything is boding very well at this point. The releases of the snails that we've done to date, putting them into new habitats, have been incredibly successful. Um, all of the snails have gained weight and seem to be thriving in their new environment. I think the chance of survival of the snails is, is great. The big uncertainty for us is the long-term outcome for those releases. Will they breed at these sites because they weren't found at these sites before? How long will they survive at these sites? Because we need a population that's going to um, continue in perpetuity, basically. And to me, that's the biggest unknown we've got in this program, is their survival on the hill. Solid Energy does not um, see that its responsibility ends upon the capture and removal of the snails from site. Solid Energy have been um, dedicated to ensuring the long-term survival of the species. As uh, some of the snails are tagged with monitoring devices, that monitoring work uh, will be undertaken for at least the next 10 years, and that's uh, part of the condition in the wildlife permit, but it's also uh, in our interest to ensure that that work is done. We also uh, will be controlling predators and pests in that area to maximise the chances of the snail's survival once they've been released back into the environment, and in fact probably enhance the chances that existed prior to our undertaking the mining. The next step is to establish a breeding population in captivity. In order to do this, Solid Energy has purchased environmental chambers to house its captive snail population. The environmental chambers are so we can simulate the environment that the snails experience in the wild. So each chamber's got a temperature control, and we can simulate day and night by turning lights on and off, of course, and we can simulate rain. There's nozzles on there, we can produce rainfall and have really high humidity. So that's, yeah, to copy the environment that they've got on the wild. We don't know whether breeding off the snails is triggered by environmental cues. It's very likely that it is, that, for instance, temperatures rising in springtime might trigger mating behaviour and might trigger egg laying, because we've observed that they mainly lay eggs in springtime, so there must be some cue that they know this is the time to do it. And because we want to establish a captive breeding population, we want to be able to yeah, facilitate that to make it work, that we actually get recruitment in captivity. In the 21st century, if you want to continue to operate, whether you're a coal miner or a gold miner or a real estate developer, you can only do so if you can demonstrate that what you're doing is sustainable from an environmental perspective and a number of other perspectives as well, but certainly from an environmental perspective. If we wish to continue to mine into the future and for society to accept that mining is part of our, our life and our way of, of doing things, then you have to be able to demonstrate that as part of that, you will undertake it responsibly and in such a way that you don't end up compromising the existence, in this case, of a snail to a point where it would no longer be alive. You wouldn't be able to find one. And really there's no difference between, between a snail and, and a kiwi, perhaps. And clearly the whole world would be up in arms if you uh, were to go and kill the last kiwi. Um, and so the, really there's no difference between that approach and that which we have taken over these snails, which were identified as being significant. Their habitat lay on top of what was a, what still is, a very significant coal resource and plays a very major part in the life of our mine there for probably the next 10 or 15 years. And so the only way for the two issues to, to uh, continue to exist was for us to manage both the extraction rate of coal and the removal of the snails from the site before we started removing the coal. It's kind of like the more you learn, the more you learn. Absolutely. Knowledge is like a balloon. The more you put in it, the bigger the outside gets. <laughs>